it is one of the most famous battles in the history of the world. Pitting one of the greatest military minds the world has ever seen against an allied Europe. On one side, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of France. Opposing Napoleon, an army of British and Dutch allies led by the Duke of Wellington. 250,000 foot soldiers, 100,000 cavalrymen, 900 cannons. On June 18, 1815, these men and their weapons would meet to determine the fate of the world. On a small field in Europe, at a place called Waterloo. June 18th, 1815, four hours into the Battle of Waterloo, two vast armies are locked in mortal combat. On one side, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of France. Napoleon, as a commander and a strategist, was one of the greatest commanders in history. On the other side, an allied army under the future Duke of Wellington. Wellington was the natural man to lead the united forces of the Allies against Napoleon. At stake, all of Europe. At 4 p.m., 12,000 French horsemen thunder toward the British line in one of the greatest cavalry charges in history. The Allies quickly formed British infantry squares. The squares were lines and lines of bayonets. But are they enough to survive this massive charge? Wellington was looking for the back door. He knew his army had just about had it. The result of this clash will determine the course of the battle and the future of Europe. Can the Allies save themselves and the continent? from Napoleon Bonaparte. Ten years earlier, in 1805, Napoleon had begun expanding the French Empire, winning battle after battle, marching undefeated until he controlled nearly all of Western Europe. But his attempt to conquer Russia failed. While he defeated the Russian army, he couldn't defeat the Russian winner. By 1814, the Allied forces captured Napoleon, restored the French monarchy, and exiled the fallen emperor to Elba, a tiny Mediterranean island. The Allied nations of Europe believed that Napoleon Bonaparte was no longer a threat. A little short little video there, of course, uh, from a preview that most of you will be watching, my students, of course, uh, of course of the assignment that I've got, of course, on Napoleon. So anyway, of course, welcome you back, of course, to History 1123, Daniel Simon, Baton Rouge Community College. I uh, hope you're doing great out there uh, this week. Uh, yeah, I will have this upcoming quiz, of course, I'll, I'll have for you, which is on that, of course, documentary uh, about the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, of course, the battle that Napoleon lost and pretty much his career was over uh, militarily and pretty much as an emperor of Europe. So anyway, uh, of course, uh, well, it looks like I've got a few students watching right now this morning. Uh, looks like David, Christina. Hey, what's going on out there? Hope you're doing great. Savannah, good morning. Uh, and then, of course, like Hope right now. Looks like she's watching uh, also as well. So hope everybody's doing great uh, out there, of course, today. Uh uh, in today's lecture, of course, I will be, like I said, continuing talking about Napoleon. And of course, you know, he's pretty much dominant in Europe in the early 1800s, at least up to 1814, 1815. So we'll kind of get into that. Uh, of course, we will get into talk about how what happened to his empire because it collapsed pretty quick. It was just kind of like what happened to Adolf Hitler in the Nazi Ger Germany and all that collapsed pretty quick within a few years, uh, like his empire did as well. So it says part of a two-part series, of course, on the age of Napoleon. I will probably get have time today also to kind of talk about what happened basically post-Napoleon Europe, like afterwards in 1800. So I'll probably talk a little bit about that too uh, also uh, as well. Uh, by the way, a reminder about assignments uh, for, of course, uh, you've got 
coming up, of course, on Canvas. Um, yeah, they have that Enlightenment Scientific uh, Revolution quiz. That one's still up. That'll be due later at the end of the week. So don't forget about that. Now, I do have a new assignment for you to do. Uh, that probably won't be due till next week, but it's on the Battle of Waterloo. A little short video clip I just showed you. Uh, so uh, you need to go ahead and watch the whole thing, of course. And, of course, have that assignment. Uh, get that done next week. So that's, of course, something new, of course, I've given you uh, for this week. There should be an announcement about it that it's sent out. Of course, hopefully you saw that uh, overall. And, uh, yeah, I will be having an exam coming up soon. I think I'm thinking maybe next week sometimes. I want to say Tuesday I might be able to have one coming up, which I think our exam is mostly going to be on this period. We're kind of doing French Revolution uh, age of Napoleon and probably like some of the post-Napoleon Europe period in the 1800s. I'll probably also throw some stuff on there as well. I think it's not going to have as much as I usually do because we've got spring break coming up uh, uh, soon. So kind of have to take a break. So we'll probably have to go ahead and give you an exam early. So we'll have to do. All right. So uh, anyway, uh, of course, today, like I said, I'm going to move on, of course, to talk about, you know, the age, the age of Napoleon kind of, you know, mostly talk about the end of it, like what happened to uh, Napoleon's empire. Uh, and um, yeah, Napoleon's empire, it uh, collapsed pretty quick. Uh, kind of like what happened with Adolf Hitler uh, with Nazi Germany. I think Hitler had kind of taken over most of Europe by 1941, 42, and it collapsed within two, three years. Napoleon's similar to that. Collapsed in a few years, a little longer, I think, than, than Hitler lasted uh, but, uh, yeah, this is all after he had defeated, like, a bunch of those coalitions, like, in those wars, like the War of the Third and Fourth Coalitions, also the Fifth Coalition, where he defeated Austria in 1809, and ends up marrying Marie Louise, I think, in 1810. Uh, you know about that. We talked about it before. But, uh, yeah, what caused the decline and the collapse of the Napoleonic Empire? It's, there's multiple reasons of why uh, his empire uh, fell apart. And of course, a lot of it had to do with the fact that he couldn't defeat the British, uh, the British Navy, which was, you know, very powerful in the world. You know, the British empires all over the world were getting to be uh, at that point. But um, I'll kind of go through a few things that were kind of a cause of what they think caused it to, you know, collapse. Obviously, in the video, they talked about one thing, which was, you know, his invasion of Russia in 1812 pretty much was the main thing that really caused it. They do talk about things like the continental system, which was an idea of Napoleon to try to defeat the British. He thought maybe we can't beat them naval-wise, militarily, uh, but he was thinking that maybe we could put like this massive blockade on Britain and their empire and prevent people from trading with them. And so Napoleon forced countries in Europe uh, to become his ally, and they weren't and, you know, they weren't allowed to trade with the British. Uh, and so that was the point of, you know, what the continental system was about. It's kind of like this big blockade of Britain and its empire. Uh, and, um, and uh, of course, the only thing about it was it caused other conflicts. If you know about this, it caused the War of 1812 to break out in 1812 between the United States uh, and the British, British Empire because the fact that the United States wanted to trade with the French uh, because we were kind of a new republic at the time over here. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, British didn't like us trading with the French as so they started seizing our ships. Uh, they even impressed our sailors uh, into the British Navy. And so the United States decided to declare, declare war on the British. Uh, so it lasts like two, three years, 1812 uh, to 1815. I think Britain even invaded the United States, if you know about this, burned the White House down. They actually attacked, attacked Washington, D.C. and burned the White House down, the original White House. Uh, but I think we eventually beat them at the Battle of New Orleans. You know about this, 1850, like January of 1850, I think was when it was. Uh, but, um, but yeah, that's one thing that was kind of famous, I guess, about that, how it kind of spilled over into other conflicts. It's amazing how powerful the British were. They were fighting us as they were fighting Napoleon. So you know, it's kind of amazing, you know, in that time period, more or less. But, uh, yeah, why the, why the continents didn't fail? I can give you two examples. One was the fact that the British Navy was just too powerful. So you know, he, the, the French Navy was not as great. So he, he couldn't really stop their, their naval power. 
And then free trade. Uh, the fact that countries were starting to believe that free trade was the way to go, like early capitalism. And so uh, that's another reason why the continental system didn't work, because these countries in Europe wanted to trade with Britain, et cetera. Now, I think I've got some uh, other kind of um, slides here you can look at later if you want. Here's kind of a map of the continental system. So it's kind of this economic plan to try and weaken the British, get them out of the war, like a blockade. Uh, more or less. But British, like I said, you know, they've got a better Navy. So it's impossible really for them to really do anything about that. Uh, then, of course, uh, you've also got this other deal that uh, they think caused the decline of the uh, Napoleonic Empire. And of course, that's the so-called Peninsular War. Uh, you may have heard about uh, that was fought in the uh, eight early 1800s, about 1808 to 1814 is about the years of it. I guess about a six-year war. Uh, it's called the Peninsular War because it was fought on the Iberian Peninsula, which was in the southern western part of Europe. And this was a conflict that was caused by the fact that Portugal and Spain uh, wanted to trade with the British. They didn't really like the continental system. Uh, and so I think they were smuggling stuff in and out, you know, like that. Uh, and so... Uh, Napoleon decided he was going to invade, uh, which he invaded Spain, he invaded Portugal. I think at one point he even put his brother on the throne, if you know about this in Spain, as king, which was um, Joseph, Joseph Bonaparte, I think briefly the king of Spain, uh, which upset the Spanish and all that. The Portuguese were mad. And so uh, it basically caused this huge war to break out, uh, which would last, like I said, six years or so. Uh, and uh, it became a guerrilla war. Uh, in fact, the term guerrilla or guerrilla war, which I think guerrilla means little war originally, uh, was a type of conflict where Spanish and Portuguese, uh, you know, used guerrilla warfare against the French uh, and with being backed up by the British. The British came in, uh, began supplying them uh, with troops and forces, money, uh, weapons, uh, and the Duke of Wellington, we'll get to later, of course, was involved in trying to aid, uh, of course, Spanish, Spanish, Portuguese, of course, in the Iberian Peninsula. And uh, this conflict uh, was uh, important because of the fact that it kind of weakened Napoleon, like it weakened him on his western side, I guess, western flank, I guess, of his empire, uh, pretty much. Kind of like Hitler having to fight all over the place, Italy, North Africa, uh, Eastern Front, Western Front. And so all these different fronts, you know, eventually kind of take a toll uh, on Napoleon's empire. They say he lost something like 300,000 men you know, trying to, you know, keep control of, uh, the, of, of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and they, uh, also the French were known for, if you know about this, committing atrocities uh, where they killed people, like even civilians and things like that. And so French kind of got a bad name uh, for, of course, the Peninsular War uh, that took place course there. Oh, also one thing on the side too that's famous about the Peninsula War you may have heard about, it did spark the so-called Latin American Revolution. That's true about that. So all the people back home, like in the colonies in the New World, Spain, Spain and Portugal had, they all rebelled. Like in Brazil, you know, the Portuguese rebelled, created their own state. I think, which was called the Empire of Brazil, which later became the Republic of Brazil. Uh, and then I think like a bunch of, uh, of course, in Latin America, Mexico rebelled, you know, in foreign Mexico, uh, Argentina, uh, you know, Colombia, Venezuela, all those areas kind of started rebelling, basically. You may have heard of Simon Boulevard. who was very famous in South America. And he was one of the, the big revolutionary leaders that rebel. Uh, and they start kind of, creating their own uh, states uh, in Latin America that they have now. So it all starts like in, I think, around the eight, early 1800s, you know, when that really takes off, basically. Uh, of course, the other thing they always talk about, you know, is the fact that, you know, Napoleon decided in 1812 he was going to invade Russia. Uh, that's pretty much considered the main cause of Napoleon's decline. His empire collapses mostly due to the invasion of Russia in 1812. Uh, but why did he do it? You know, like that's a little bit different co compared to Hitler. Hitler, you know, wanted to invade the Soviet Union because he wanted to conquer the East. I think Hitler believed in what they call Lebensraum. Germany needed um, living space. 
you know, for Germans. So he wanted to take over and colonize the East uh, and all that and add that to the Nazi Germany. Uh, but uh, Napoleon's reason for going into Russia was because of uh, the Russians and Alexander I, who I've talked about before, their ruler, was violating the continental system. Uh, he wanted to trade with the British. I think Russia needed grain, uh, you know, and you still have that little ice age, I think, going on at the time where the, you know, the winters were kind of still cold, uh, you know. Uh, and so that's why Napoleon decided he was going to invade Russia to force the Russians back into uh, his alliance with them that they had made. Remember, you remember correctly, the Peace of Tilsit, uh, I think 1807, I guess it was, yes. Uh, and yeah, the, the invasion of Russia was considered one of the largest invasions in history up to that point. Yeah, one of the largest. Uh, I think the one that when Hitler invaded Soviet Union, it was like 3 million troops or more. This one had like something like 600,000 range uh, where Hitler invaded from Poland, uh, which I think the French pretty much kind of controlled that time. Uh, and uh, the Grand Army uh, mass, I think they say six, 700,000 is like the range, I think, of how many troops, which I think was the peak of the Grand Army uh, at the time. About June 1812, you can see. Uh, and um, they say the date of when Napoleon invaded was almost the same date as Hitler. I think it's off by one year, but uh, late June. Uh, I think June, the, I believe it was June the 23rd uh, is the date uh, when Napoleon invaded. I think Hitler was June the 22nd. It's kind of ironic, the dates. They're very similar. Seems like Hitler would, uh, Hitler would have learned that what happened with Napoleon, you know. Uh, by the way, uh, the Grand Army had like only, only like maybe up 200,000 troops were actually French. Uh, the rest were all mercenaries that they got from Europe, Polish, Germans, so on, uh, that were in it. Uh, and uh, a lot of them didn't really want to fight. They were kind of there as mercenaries that they were forced to, I guess, be conscripted uh, into the military. And the Russians, if you know about it, used this scorched earth policy against, against the French. Uh, they burned their crops. They, they take, took their cattle away. Uh, they... I think they even kind of buildings they left behind, they burned them or destroyed them. Uh, so they couldn't have any shelter. So most of uh, Napoleon's troops, as they, you know, entered Russia and invaded, you know, west to east, uh, realized that they were walking into a very poor country that did not have a whole lot of food. Uh, and so a lot of his men, I think the whole time they were trying to basically invade, they were trying to forage for food uh, to live off the land. Because Napoleon, you see there, once remarked that an army walks on its stomach. Well, they need food and all that. And some believe that Napoleon lost Russia because of really logistic issues, uh, because the supply lines are so long from Poland, you know, all the way into Russia. Russia's a massive country, you know, largest country in the world still. Uh, and so, yeah, Hitler finds that out too, you know, when he invades uh, as well. So, yeah, we'll get to that later about, about World War II, what, what happens, but that doesn't go well with the Eastern Front for Hitler either. Uh, the most famous battle uh, that was fought uh, in, in the study about the war, of course, is the, um, they have the uh, Battle of Borodino uh, that took place, uh, which uh, happened, uh, I believe the date of Borodino is September 7th. Uh, you can see 1812. It's considered a tactical victory by the French, but I think some people call it a fireic victory because neither army really won. I think Napoleon just pushed them off the field, but he wasn't able to destroy their army. And they, I think the casualty rates were like 90 some thousand killed and wounded on both sides. It was really, really just awful battle. And um, Leo Tolstoy, you may have heard of him, famous Russian writer, you know, about that novelist was influenced by that battle and later wrote, of course, War and Peace, which is about that period of the Napoleonic War. It's really a really great book, but very few people actually try to finish it. <laughs> it's so thick. It's like the Bible, you know, trying to read it. Uh, but he, he heavily describes that battle, how bad it was on both sides. And Tolstoy thought that that battle helped to destroy uh, Napoleon's army in Russia. He was kind of battered by it uh, in but he does take Moscow. He does take Moscow, I think, by the end of September, like about a week, a few couple weeks later. 
Uh, but when he get, takes over Moscow, uh, Alexander I refused to surrender or even sue for peace. Uh, I've got your city, you know, I've got your, I mean, one of their main capitals, I guess, of Russia at the time. But um, Alexander didn't, didn't, want to, didn't want to sue for peace. Uh, of course, the Russians had burned the city as they entered into uh, Moscow. And so they, they're forced to retreat at that point you know, back to Poland. And so, yeah, on the retreat, you know, between like October to November uh, of 18, 1812, that's when Napoleon's forces really get battered, if you know about that, by the Russian winter. The winter pretty much helps wipe out the most of his forces along with all the Russian forces, Cossack forces, you know, harassing his flanks on the way, on the retreat back. Uh, and he ends up losing something like 90% of his army. He's killed, wounded, captured, missing. Uh, he had a lot of men that deserted, I think, on the campaign. Uh, and so, yeah, the invasion of Russia turns out to be one of the bloodiest conflicts of the Napoleonic Wars. More men killed in, were killed in that campaign uh, than any other uh, compared to later in the war or before the war. And you can see like something like 900,000 were killed, wounded, and missing on both sides. Yeah, in 1812, that's a lot of people, uh, at least for that time. It's almost a million. And uh, that, But that pales in comparison, you can see there, compared to the Eastern Front in World War II. If you know about World War II, I think the casualty rates between the Germans, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union was something like 20, 30 million killed on both sides. I think 20 million for the Soviets, and I don't, Seven or eight million, I think, for the Germans, I think, or something like that. Crazy amount. So just ridiculous numbers uh, with that. Um, now, um, yeah, oh, here's kind of a, they've done this for years, I know, but they've made these little little maps or I guess graphs that kind of show you what happens to uh, Napoleon's army, you know, over time. And you can see he starts out with this huge army uh, in the West as they cross into Poland and Russia. You can see how the army gets depleted as it gets towards Moscow here. And then that's on the way back. This is the retreat. The army just slowly just shrinks to almost nothing, uh, pretty much. So, yeah, they show images of Napoleon, like here. This is a famous painting of him, you know, riding on a horse and all that. But I think they seem to think that Napoleon actually rode around on a some kind of sled or something like that, a horse-driven sled, and got three meals a day still because he was the emperor, but everybody else struggled, you know, to get back. And most men didn't get back. A lot of men died, you know, of course, on that campaign. So pretty much, like I said, that was, you know, the downfall, you know, of Napoleon's empire. Him, His army really wasn't beat, per se, like, you know, in a battle. But, you know, just the logistics of it and the winter uh, took such a toll uh, that it wiped out most of his army on the way back. So uh, with Napoleon's forces beaten in Russia, what happened was the Europeans formed another coalition against them. The Sixth Coalition formed uh, basically, that should be 1815, uh, 1814 and 1815 is when they fight, of course, Napoleon. I think actually, actually that should be 1813, 1815 should be the years actually, which is actually correct uh, right here. Yeah, 1813, 1815 actually. Because uh, it formed in 1813, and I think it's around until 1814, 1815. And um, anyway, yeah, uh, even Austria came in, uh, which, you know, Austria, you know, Francis, Emperor Francis II, you know, who um, was the father-in-law of Napoleon. He's even, you know, getting involved too. The British, uh, the Swedes, uh, Prussia, Russia, uh, all these countries in Europe pretty much gang up on Napoleon at that point. Hey, Kamika, good morning. Hope you're doing great uh, out there. Yeah, here's the actual coalition force that fight against them. I think, I think I've got them here, but the main ones that fight them the most, I know, in Europe, Russia, Austria, Prussia, and Sweden. So they, they put up most of the forces, at least in the East and in Germany uh, and all that. Napoleon does fight a famous battle, which they call it different names. Uh, in Europe. They often call it either the Battle of Leipzig, because it occurs at Leipzig, which is in northern Germany, or the other name they call it too, you see, the Battle of 
the nations, usually a battle of the nations, I think is what they call it. Actually, it's what it is. In this battle, uh, Napoleon's forces were heavily outnumbered, like two to one. Uh, you, know, you can see it took place in October 1813, October 16th to the 19th. It's like a four-day battle is what it is. He's outnumbered two to one, uh, and um, he's badly routed. In fact, his forces are almost encircled uh, and destroyed uh, by the European powers, but he was able to escape uh, with some of his forces, and he's forced to retreat back towards France, back back toward the frontiers or you know natural borders of France about at that time. And so Napoleon, you know, ends up losing like most of his territories that he had gained over several years. It was all lost just overnight. Uh, 1813. And uh, Leipzig, by the way, was one of the largest battles in history so far in Europe. Like something like 500 something thousand troops fought on one battlefield at the same time. You don't see this again, by the way, until World War I uh, with the first Battle of the Marne uh, in 1914, I think September, where they had like something like 2 million troops all fight at the same time uh, in France. That's when the Germans tried to take Paris at the beginning of World War I, but it led to a stalemate in the Western Front. I'll get to that later uh, as well. Uh, the coalition powers, by the way, uh, they eventually invade France. Uh, they're led by Emperor Alexander I uh, into Paris, and they forced Napoleon to abdicate the throne. Uh, and uh, Napoleon wanted to put his son on the throne, by the way. He had a son. I don't know if I talked about his son, did I? I don't think I did. Napoleon had a son, they, they called it Napoleon II. Uh, he wanted to put him on the throne, but he was like a like a young child, but they refused. Uh, also, Napoleon also tried to commit suicide, which is true as well. He actually had some poison made for him that I think was strong enough to kill two men. And when he took it, it didn't kill him uh, for some reason. Uh, the uh, uh, coalition forces then sent Napoleon into exile. Uh, they sent him to this island off the coast of Italy, a little bitty island called Elba, which is kind of like kind of parallel to where Sardinia is. It's kind of not that far from Corsica either. Uh, and he lived on the island for like nine, ten months. Uh, the coalition forces and, and the French even gave Napoleon like a pension. Uh, and I think he was given a title, which was um, Emperor of Elba, which is <laughs> how far he's fallen, you know, since. You know, he was emperor of Euro. So, so that's kind of what happened with Napoleon. He's exiled at that point. You know, everybody thinks they've gotten rid of Napoleon, you know, at that point. Uh, however, uh, one of the things that happens next, if you know about it, is the allies of the coalition powers in Europe uh, then have this great peace conference that they have, which you may have heard about. It's, uh, it's very famous uh, in Europe, which is called the Congress of Vienna. Uh, that occurs. And uh, it's this uh, diplomatic conference between the different great powers of Europe. They all meet in Vienna, Austria, to decide, you know, what's going to be, you know, the post-Napoleon Europe uh, that they're going to have. Uh, and um, it's basically uh, something that uh, is, um, it creates a lot of the policies that will be in Europe afterwards that will be later called the so-called Age of Metternich. Uh, that they'll have, which was named after Cl Clemens von Metternich. Metternich was this uh, Austrian diplomat who was a statesman, and he pretty much controlled a lot of the policies that went uh, into the uh, so-called uh, Congress of Vienna. And uh, they called it later afterwards all kinds of names, the Vienna system, the Congress of Vienna. Uh, the um, There's all kinds of nicknames they called it uh, overall. And... Um, the idea of the Congress of Vienna was to create this uh, stable order of peace uh, in Europe. Uh, and they, they didn't really want to have one country have, you know, power over another country. And so that was the point of why they created the Congress of Vienna, uh, you know, to create a, you know, a lasting peace, uh, which they did. Like it lasted a long time. You study about, you know, the Congress of Vienna. I think it kind of kept peace until World War I, uh, more or less, that they had. The, I would call it, yeah, the Congress system is kind of the common name they would call it. But um, 
I'll get to the age of Metternich, which happens after the age of Napoleon. It's like 1815 to like 1848. It's very staunch conservative. They, they don't really want any ideas of like the revolution or Napoleon spreading around. They pretty much prefer conservative values politically in Europe. Uh, they don't like liberalism. They don't like radical ideas. Uh, and anybody that tries to do that, they try to get rid of them. Like I know in Italy, they had like Giuseppe Massini and other guys like that that tried to spread Republican ideas and so on. Uh, and a lot of these guys were kind of exiled and things like that, uh, more or less. So, yeah, yeah, stuff like that kind of going on. Uh, also, they restored the boundaries of Europe. Like you can see if you go to this map here, they kind of draw up the boundaries of Europe. I'll get to it later. I don't think we have to know about it now. They create like this thing called the German Confederation you see in the central part of Europe, which replaced the Holy Roman Empire. That was a collection of um, German states that mostly have like countries like Prussia, Austria in it, uh, Bavaria, and others. Uh, and uh, it was kind of created as this replacement for the um, Holy Roman Empire that Napoleon had gotten rid of in 1806. So they didn't bring it back. And uh, that's important later. The German Confederation is the prototype state later to what we call Germany, which will form out of the so-called North German Confederation. That will become the German Empire, but it will be without Austria, of course, in it. So, so yeah, the, uh, the Congress is trying to create this stable, you know, Europe, you know, where France, Russia, Austria, Prussia, Britain, all kind of are equal to each other. And France isn't trying to take over everything or some other country, more or less. But we will get to it later. You know, the, the Germans will become, you know, unified in the late 19th century. And that's what causes, you know, everything to kind of be thrown out the window with the Congress system, you know. So that peace kind of gets killed later, of course. Uh, oh, the other thing that the uh, Congress did, too, which is true about it, they restored the Bourbons to France. Like the Bourbon dynasty was brought back in, which is true about that. Uh, they put in power Louis XVIII, uh, who was the younger brother of Louis XVI. He reigned from 1814 to 1824, you can see. You're probably wondering what happened to Louis XVII, or was there a Louis XVII? People always, of course, ask me that. And... Um, yeah, there was, the son of Louis XVI. Uh, he had died in, the, in prison uh, during the French Revolution, uh, but he was never really king, not officially. Uh, but what happened was the Bourbons kind of counted him as a king, uh, and they acted like the French Revolution didn't happen, or Napoleon didn't happen either. They, they skipped it, like it never happened. <laughs> yeah, and uh, anyway, so they kind of put in, and he's the guy that was the actual ruler, you know, when they had the French Revolution, uh, and Napoleon after Louis the Sixteenth was killed, 1792. So I guess he's the king from 1792 to, I guess 1814, uh, more or less, even though he's dead. Uh, and so that's why the other guys, you know, Louis the Eighteenth, uh, is the reason for it. Uh, however, you know, if you know what happened, Napoleon would return to, as they're at the Congress, you know, at Vienna, they hear about Napoleon coming back. Uh, of course. Uh, to Europe to get his throne back uh, a second time. Uh, and he reigns uh, in 1815 for like three months or so, uh, which they call it later the so-called 100 days. Uh, as from March, you see the June 1815. Uh, and Napoleon was kind of miffed. He was on Elba. Uh, I think the French decided that they weren't going to pay his pension or anything like that. Uh, and so Napoleon thinks that he can come back uh, and seize power. Uh, Louis XVIII, I think, wasn't really that popular. Uh, and so people still like Napoleon. And so he was whisked away on ships and brought back uh, to France. Uh, and when Louis XVIII sent troops to have him arrested, what happened was all the men he sent to actually arrest him joined him instead. Yeah, yeah, that, ha that happened. Uh, yeah, I think they talk about that little short documentary. I'll, 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 of course, uh, I'm going to post on my channel as well. But um so he returns, uh, and so he's he's forced to raise an army real fast because, uh, you know, he realized that if he doesn't do something, he's going to get invaded again, uh, like before in 1814. And so he quickly decides that what he's going to do, he's going to go on the offensive because he's got to try to see if he can defeat some forces to, you know, be able to keep his throne uh, at that point. And so what Napoleon decides in 1815 
he decides to invade Belgium, you know, to north northeast of, of France. Uh, and uh, he he's doing that because the British, the British, uh, and that should be by the way, British and the Prussian forces are nearby uh, in Belgium, and then the Russian and Austrian forces are a little further away. Uh, they think that basically that if he could defeat them first, then maybe he could defeat the Russians and the Prussia, Russians and the Austrians later as well. Because he didn't want to take them all at the same time, which would be bad. Uh, so uh, what happened was it led to the so-called Waterloo campaign that they usually call it, you know, the Waterloo campaign. And he goes up against this general you may have heard of named the Duke of Wellington, uh, who's also, of course, known as Sir Arthur Wellesley. Uh, Wellesley was considered to be, by the way, one of the greatest generals in the Napoleonic Wars on the British side. He had all kinds of nicknames. They called him the English Leopard. That was a name that the Spanish called him, by the way, when he was helping them uh, in, you know, in, in Europe and the Iberian Peninsula. And Iron Duke was another nickname uh, he was called. He's a very tough commander. Uh, and he was, he was, I don't know if you know much about Wellington, but he was very good on the defensive. Not so much an offensive type, you know, commander, uh, more or less. Uh, but he was considered one of the greatest generals, you know, in the Napoleonic Wars and all that. I think there was even talk of sending Wellington to fight the United States in the War of 1812 and all that, I think. But the war ended, I think. But um, what happened with Welling uh, Wellington, of course, was that uh, uh, they, the battle took place in what is Belgium, like central Belgium is about where it's at today, the actual battlefield, which I think was some kind of like, like a rye field, like a some kind of uh, agricultural area where it was they fought. I think it was a field of rye, I believe is what it was. And um, I have a map of the battlefield I'll show you. But yeah, he, so he opposed them. Uh, they'll have later the Prussians come in too as well uh, in, in the battle. But um, here's the battlefield today uh, that you're looking at. Uh, so you got that there. Uh, also, they have the famous uh, so-called Lion's Mound I'll talk about. that was later added there by the Belgians uh, to honor, I think, some of their troops that had fallen there. I'll, I'll talk about that later, but Wellington didn't like that there, put there. You know about that story. And uh, what happened against Wellington's forces was Napoleon, um, he uh, decided he was going to do a bunch of uh, charges against Wellington because he was worried about the Prussians coming to help him. Uh, and Wellington had the high ground. That was the thing about that uh, at the battlefield. And so Napoleon decided that he was going to do multiple charges. He first charged his cavalry, if you know about this, and they were broken. Uh, and then at the end, he even tried his infantry. If you know about it, he sent up the French Imperial Guard, uh, which was like his best crack troops. Uh, usually he would save those from the end, like of a battle if he, was, he needed them, but he usually didn't. Uh, and they actually broke too. Uh, also as well. Uh, and so, uh, but they think that Napoleon's forces could have recovered. They could have attacked him again and maybe broke through uh, and defeated Wellington's forces quite possibly. But what happened was the Prussian forces led by Gebhardt von Blücher uh, came in uh, to reinforce Wellington's. And so it basically gave uh, the coalition side almost double the forces of the French had. And so, Basically, his forces got overwhelmed uh, in the battle. Uh, by the way, uh, Napoleon probably had about 125,000 troops, by the way, in the battle. Wellington had 93,000, but Blucher had 120,000. So you can see that obviously, you know, you know, changed everything with that. And it caused basically Napoleon's force to collapse afterwards. And uh, the term Waterloo, by the way, uh, is a term, by the way, today, uh, if you look it up in the dictionary, I think it means something like a decisive defeat uh, is what it means now. Uh, so the term, and so it was decisive because uh, what's going to end up happening, of course, with Napoleon uh, is that he's going to be sent into exile, of course, after he abdicates. Uh, by the way, going back to the so-called lion's mound here, uh, there was a famous story, of course, where um, Wellington, years later, if you know about it, went back to the battlefield to visit it. Uh, and, of course, what happened was the Belgians had gone there and they put this monument there. They built there in 1826, uh, which was built there to honor, you know, the, the Belgians that, I guess, had participated with the British uh, against, against the French. 
And Wellington said the famous comment, he said, what the hell did they do to my battlefield? Was the famous comment. <laughs> so he wasn't too happy about it. I guess it kind of does mess up the battlefield, that big monstrosity that's, of course, there. But I guess the Belgians are happy now that it's you know, there and all that. So, yeah, Napoleon uh, is, like I said, he's sent into exile. Uh, he's sent to this island that's basically uh, in the Atlantic. He abdicates, they think, four days later after Waterloo, June 22nd, 1815. Uh, so he's forced to abdicate. Uh, and uh, he's sent to this island, which is in the middle of nowhere. It's a British-held island, which is off the coast of Africa. It's like Central Atlantic Ocean. You'd miss it, you know, if you were ship going by. Uh, and uh, he was forced to live there for the next five and a half years, 1815 uh, to 1821. So it was a very desolate island. And uh, the British gave him this house to live in, which I'll show you, which is right here. That's his final home, uh, which was called Longwood. And uh, apparently it was a, some kind of cattle barn that they converted into a house. Uh, so he had a place to live. And uh, he did not get along with, with his British masters. You know, the guy that jailer or whatever that ran the island uh, wouldn't call him emperor. They called him General Napoleon or something like that, that kind of thing. But they wouldn't call him emperor. He was just miffed about that. Uh, and um, it was a boring life, by the way, living at Longwood. Now, sometimes he would take strolls or ride horses, I guess, around uh, the island or whatever. Uh, but he would sit around, you know, playing cards, reading paper, newspapers and books. Uh, I think he invented a, some kind of game of solitaire or something, if you know about that, uh, Napoleon. Uh, the most famous thing that Napoleon did, I guess, at, at Longwood, of course, on St. Helena, was that he, um, he he dictated his memoirs. That's well known, of course, today. And that really helped to rehabilitate his image because if you know about Napoleon, <clears throat> Napoleon's not a... Uh, like a Hitler, <clears throat> you know, he did, I think his wars, you know, killed like over 3 million people, you know, uh, in Europe, but later people kind of look up to him. He becomes this um, figure that's kind of controversial. He's kind of seen, he's kind of like Donald Trump. He's kind of this guy that some people like and some people hate. So he's celebrated, but he's controversial. He's kind of like both, you know, on that side. Uh, but he's, you know, got this legacy that he's left behind <clears throat> because of his, military influences, uh, his influences also in law, the Polyanic Code. Uh, he also uh, popularized the idea of nationalism in Europe. There's <clears throat> another thing, of course, that happened as well. <clears throat> uh, Napoleon later died in 1821. Uh, he was only 51 years old. And um, there has been some controversies over his death. Uh, some people, of course, think he died of stomach cancer, but there has been some theories that he may have been poisoned. I know there was this famous dentist, I think, I want to say in Sweden, that came up with a theory that he may have been poisoned with arsenic, quite possibly. So it was that theory uh, as well, but nobody really knows uh, for sure about that. But his ideas of nationalism do influence people later. That's something he does do. You know, he went into all these different countries in Europe people start thinking, hey, I could have my own country or, or something like that. Same thing in Latin America. Uh, and so that's something that's important later. Uh, Napoleon's also seen as this man of the people as well. You know, he's one of these first people that come from humble origins, that come from nothing. He wasn't even ability. He became this emperor of Europe, you know, and that was kind of seen as kind of being something unique and different that no one had done before. So, so, yeah, Napoleon's this figure that people, you know, like still today. Uh, but some people think, you know, he was a bad guy, too. You know, some of the things he may have done, you know, in his conquest. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to move on today. I've got a few minutes left. I'm going to, of course, next talk about, I'm going to kind of get into the 19th century a little bit. Uh, I'll kind of talk about the post-Napoleon Europe, uh, mostly dealing with the French, uh, what happened uh, over there. So I'll kind of get into that uh, as as well. Uh, yeah, what happened, of course, after they exiled Napoleon a second time? Well, uh, yeah, they put the Bourbons back in, of course, which they did in 1815. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, the Bourbons came back in. Uh, they put in King Louis XVIII. 
So he's put in power. Uh, and um, I didn't go into the kind of government they put in France after they got rid of Napoleon, but they put in a constitutional monarchy, which is true. And it was based on this constitution that they either call the Charter of 1814 or some people call it also the French Charter of 1814. And uh, it was a type of constitution which had a uh, assembly they created that was called the Chambers, I think is what some people called it. I don't know if it ever had an official name, but people would call it that, the Chambers. And it was a bicameral legislature that was very similar to the British one of the Parliament. You know, the Parliament's got the House of Lords, and they got the House of Commons. It's kind of what it was, what they developed. Uh, and uh, what happened was they created this um, one chamber that was called the Chamber of Deputies, and then they had this other chamber called the Chamber of Peers. And the Chamber of Deputies uh, was supposed to be like a chamber for, like, the common people, like the middle class, lower classes, and then the other one, which was the Chamber of Peers, was supposed to be for the nobility. So they're kind of they're kind of at this point, you know, uh, in France, trying to bring in uh, like the old regime, the ancient regime that they had before. I'll put it on the screen there. But basically, one was a lower house, and then one was an upper house. So you got one for different ones uh, that are there. You can see, and it's a very strange, um, like government they have. It's really more monarchical. You know, it's like the, the king has a lot of powers. Like he controls the military. Uh, he uh, he can uh, create laws. He can. He can actually create legislative laws, which he would give to the par, to the assembly, and then they would, I guess, pass them. That's what he would do. Uh, so that's like, you know, a lot more than other types of kings have had before, I guess, you know, that were constitutional monarchies. Like in Britain, they can't really do that uh, and stuff like that. And uh, But you're going to see later that's going to cause a problem, like when they try to have too much power of the king and then they end up getting overthrown. That's what's going to happen. <clears throat> uh, Louis XVIII, by the way, didn't have any children, by the way. And so the throne passed to his younger brother, who was named Charles X, who was called the Count of Ortois. Uh, he was the last Bourbon king you can see. Uh, and uh, he was a, I'll get to it later, but he was an ultra royalist uh, that really um, wanted to restore the old regime, like the way it was before, you know, before the French Revolution and Napoleon took over. <clears throat> and um, you're going to see it's going to lead to a big, big conflict, which will get into what it's called the Revolution of 1830. That's going to break out in France. So you got all these different rulers, these kings that come in. Uh, after Napoleon's exile, Louis the 18th, we talked about here, Charles the 10th, his brother. Now we'll also get to Louis Philippe. Uh, he was also down here, another ruler that comes in uh, as well. He'll kind of look at that real quick. And um, so, yeah, here's basically the reign of Charles the 10th. He reigned for about six years, 1824 uh, to 1830. Uh, he attempts to restore, like I said, the traditional ancient regime, like the absolutist regime he wanted uh, to be in power. And when he had tried to do this in 1830, it eventually led to him, him being overthrown. He's going to end up leading to the so-called Revolution of 1830, which is also called the July Revolution in France. And uh, it's going to later lead into other kings coming in. But I did want to mention a few things about uh, his reign that's kind of well known uh, under, um, I don't know if you know much about Algeria, but uh, Algeria was, um, they the French started colonizing it. And if, if you know about the 19th century, the uh, European powers start getting into what they call new imperialism, where they start colonizing like parts of Africa, Asia, and so on. And so I think the French were one of the first to do this uh, as they went into North Africa. They took over Algeria, uh, and uh, it would take years. It would take over 70 years, you can see, until 1903 uh, for them to actually do it. It took a long time because the uh, Moroccans that were next door didn't want them to take it over. It's mostly Muslims there, uh, Arab peoples and Moroccan peoples. And so basically it led to this guerrilla war, uh, which would drag on for years. 
Uh, and it's believed that the French committed a lot of atrocities, I think, genocide, I guess, when they went in there. But the French would eventually colonize Algeria. Uh, and it, Algeria was heavily influenced by the French. Well, you know about that. But going back to um, Charles X, what caused him to get overthrown in 1830 was he issued these things called the July Ordinances. And what they were, were they were a bunch of uh, ordinances that basically did several things. First of all, he was going to try to close all the newspapers down, like the press, which apparently had a lot of freedom uh, in France after the poem was exiled. And uh, that didn't go well uh, with some of the lower classes. Uh, he wanted to get rid of the chamber of, um, I think it was the chamber of deputies, not the peers. I'm sorry, got the wrong way. The chamber, the chamber of deputies was gotten rid of, I know that. Uh, under him, not the peers. That's the one for the nobility. And then uh, he also wanted to uh, prevent the middle class from really voting. Uh, only the upper class would vote. Uh, and so that that caused basically a problem uh, where the people were, were, you know, pretty much realizing that he's not really, you know, in support of, of their rights uh, and all that. Let me put that on the screen again. Yeah, yeah it's all the chamber of deputies. He was threatening to do it anyway didn't actually do it. Uh, and so what happened was it caused the people to rebel uh, in what became the so-called July Revolution, which the French sometimes call it, by the way, the Three Glorious Days. Uh, and uh, it lasted for about three three days, July 26th uh, to 29th. Charles lost control of his government uh, at that point. And it became like this coup d'etat where uh, the French basically overthrew him overnight. And it led to famous paintings like this one you may have heard of. You may have heard of seeing the uh, famous painting by Eugene Delacroix, which is called Le Liberty Leading the People. Uh, it's a well-known painting, uh, and it depicts, you know, all the people you know, involved in it. It's kind of like uh, romanticizing, I guess, the whole revolution, you know, the July Revolution that breaks out, and it kind of depicts how not just men involved, but women getting involved, children, you know, and all that. Maybe different classes of people, too. Middle class, lower class, uh, getting involved. And so, yeah, that's something they overthrew, basically, uh, uh, his regime, you know, Charles X. Uh, and, uh, of course, what ends up happening, they put in a new king uh, at that point, uh, whose name is uh, the guy they, they replace him with is a man named Louis Philippe. Who I mentioned of, or Louis Philippe I, they called him as well, uh, who was the so called Duke of Orleans, uh, they called him. He was like a cousin of the Bourbons, of you know, Louis the 18th and Charles the 10th. And uh, what was different about him was that Louis Philippe was not, he didn't seize power, you know, via hereditary means that, you know, like most kings do or whatever. He was elected to the throne uh, in a, I guess, a referendum. Uh, by the French people. And uh, by the way, he's the only ruler of the so-called House of Orleans, uh, which is a cadet branch you see of the original Capetians that went back to the Middle Ages. I think some of the Orleans, some of their relatives still claim the throne, just like the Bourbons do too. And some of the Bonapartists, people that are related to Napoleon, still claim the throne in France. They still want it back, you know, believe it or not. But I seriously doubt the French will ever go back to a monarchy again, not after all these revolutions that they've been through. Uh, so, yeah, Louis Philippe would come in. I think I had a picture of him earlier, which was uh, right here on the bottom. Yeah, Louis Philippe. Uh, and um, it's kind of a continuation of the whole constitutional monarchy with the same charter uh, at that point. And um, he'll be in power uh, from 18... Of 30 to 1848. Uh, and they called him all kinds of names, by the way. Louis Philippe, July, July Monarchy, uh, the Citizen King, the King of the French, the King of the French people, because uh, the fact that he was elected to power and not, you know, because of his hereditary background. And so, uh, and so mostly, yeah, he did support the upper middle class. That was the one group that I think wanted power again, which had been taken away uh, from them by Charles X, uh, you know. 
Uh, he is known for some things that's kind of famous I did want to mention about with uh, Louis Philippe. Uh, he did uh, bring back Napoleon. I don't know if you heard the story about this, but 1840, the French decided they were going to bring back the remains of Napoleon's body, uh, which was buried on St. Hel Helena in the Atlantic. And so he was brought back and he was put in Le Le Inveles in, in Paris, which was this uh, museum, uh, say a bunch of, Federal uh, buildings and a uh, bunch of yeah, a bunch of French buildings that are in Paris, of course, where they have like museums and monuments which honor a lot of heroes of France. It's where a lot of famous people are buried there, like generals and I think the remains of Joan of Arc is there too, uh, as well. And so he's buried there, uh, and um, I think he thought that if he did that, they would kind of make him popular or something like that. I don't know if he was ever that popular, Louis Philippe. Uh, but uh, I think after they brought back Napoleon's remains, uh, people started to think that maybe they ought to put the Bonapartes back in. You know, some of Napoleon's relatives. That becomes a popular idea later uh, in the 1840s uh, because of that. Uh, his government collapses, though, later, which is true about that. 1848, another revolution <laughs> breaks out again, uh, which is true. Um, this one was called the, uh, it's got different names. This one, uh, some people call it the February Revolution uh, in France. Uh, some people call it the Revolution of 1848 or Revolutions of 1848 uh, as well. And uh, this was a series of revolutions that were caused by problems in Europe. Uh, there were economic problems that apparently occurred right before it, 1846. Uh, they also had a deal where they had a bunch of like really bad harvests, uh, and uh, and then also you have the case where a lot of the lower classes didn't have enough rights. They didn't have a right to vote, uh, hold power uh, in general. So you got the rise of socialists, working classes uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and so it leads to a lot of different states where people rebel uh, against their governments. Uh, it sparked numerous. They're all over the place, from Italy to Austria to Poland uh, to, uh, I think, France and Britain and so on. Everybody was, I think, in Germany, all kind of rebelled against all their countries. It's one of the most widespread revolutions that ever happened in Europe. But most of them were crushed. They were. I mean, a, lot of the, a lot of the governments, they were actually suppressed. Uh, and um, what happened was, though, in France, it was not. It actually was like one of the very few where it actually worked where they actually overthrew the government. And so they were, they were overthrown in February of, um, of 1848. Uh, and what happened was it led to the French establishing a republic, like the so-called, I think they call it the Second Republic, I guess, uh, in 1848. Uh, and you can see it included a new constitution as well. Uh, and under this new constitution, they created a new assembly, which was called the National Assembly, which was a bicameral assembly, uh, and um, what occurred was the French decided that they had to get rid of, you know, they didn't want to have a monarch anymore. Uh, and so what the French decided to do was they created the, the presidency of France, so the executive position, of course, that they have today. And so what happened was in 1848, uh, they elected the first uh, president of France, it was in December, I think it was, when they did this. That was a man named Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, he was, of course, a nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, who had been in exile for years. Uh, and, of course, he came back to France, I think, after Louis Philippe's government, of course, went out of power. Uh, and so uh, I guess the popularity of you know Napoleon you know, helped propel him to be elected uh, eventually. He, by the way, would serve one term uh, as president. I think the at the time when they created the Constitution of 1848 uh, in France, there was only a one-year term, uh, basically, you could serve. Uh, and um, one thing about the French, which is very, very famous about the Constitution of 1848, it did include universal male suffrage. That's something that you hadn't seen yet, really, I think, in Europe at that point. But it was one of the first constitutions to have that where all men would get a right to vote. Um, women, not till later. I think you don't get that until around World War I, you know, 
you know about that. But uh, Napoleon was, I, have, I think I've got a picture of Napoleon to show him, uh, which uh, he's called different names, of course, to get into later. As you know, he's known as Emperor Napoleon III. Uh, and he wasn't satisfied, satisfied with being president. Uh, if you know about it, in 1851, he overthrew the government, the republic, uh, and he dissolved the National Assembly. Of course, one of the things that he did uh, was he formed what became known as the Second French Empire. It was founded in 1852, lasted almost two decades, of 1852 to 1870, and he declared himself Emperor Napoleon III. Uh, and um, <clears throat> we'll get more into this empire later, but uh, the reason why he's called Napoleon III was because he basically counted Napoleon II, son of Napoleon, as like basically a ruler of France. I guess he said that there wasn't a ruler either <laughs> after Napoleon was gone. There was no, you know, Louis XVIII, no Charles X, uh, no Louis Philippe. Napoleon II was the ruler. You know, he's dead. You know, his son died young. Napoleon's son, uh, but um, <clears throat> so he's going to form this empire, of course, uh, Louis Napoleon, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I think I'm going to stop here for today, but I'll kind of go more a little into that empire uh, later next week. I'll kind of get into it more, talk about some of the things it's known for uh, overall, because it does kind of get into a lot of conflicts in Europe, which is well, well known, And but his nephew, you know, Napoleon's nephew, Napoleon III, does kind of restore a lot of prestige uh, to France. They become a world power again, uh, more or less. They try to do, do get a lot of conflicts in Europe and even in Latin America. I'll kind of talk about that, but they do get into, into Latin America uh, as well uh, overall. So before I go, don't forget, uh, I did have some assignments, of course, <clears throat> that y'all need to kind of work on. I think I told you that there's two up right now. Enlightenment and the Scientific you know, Revolution Quiz, that's still up, of course. It'd be due by the end of the week, so don't forget about that. I'll kind of send out some uh, messages later about that. But I did po post a new assignment today, which is that Waterloo Quiz, of course, on that documentary I'm going to send out. It's also on my channel. You go to like, where all my videos are on there. I'll post it up. And uh, anyway, uh, next week I'll kind of talk more about it, but we'll get into a second exam probably next Tuesday uh, that we'll have, but you got those other assignments right now to work on, you know, and there should be a new vocab I put up too as well for you to kind of start working on for next month as well. So spring break's coming soon. You know, we don't got too many weeks left. So try to keep up with the class and all that. Uh, and I'll see y'all of course next week. So y'all have a great weekend. Okay. So take care.